All right, so I'm going to wrap up chapter um, 13. We were talking about public goods. This is important enough. Uh, this is a really important concept, not just for healthcare, but for policy in general. Uh, so I want to spend a couple of, and this is why I'm, I'm taking more time to talk about this. Whenever we have discussions about policy issues at the, at the, and what government should pay for and what it shouldn't pay for, you usually throw around this word public good, right? And it is there in, in formal policy, economics and policy and political science, the word words public goods has a very specific meaning. It is used loosely, you know, by journalists and often by politicians who are trying to push through something and activists who are trying to push something, they will use the word public good. And all they really mean by that is it's paid for by taxes, right? It's paid for by taxpayers. But public goods has a specific meaning. And we were talking about this. A public good is a non-rival, non-excludable good. And so a rival good, I use my example of Sean has a cheeseburger, right? If I also try to eat the cheeseburger, there's, there's less cheeseburger to go before Sean and I, right? That is an example of a rival good. Cheeseburgers are a rival good because um, additional users of the good reduce the quality or volume of available to other users. Um, an excludable good is a good that you can restrict access to. So a cheeseburger is also an excludable good in the sense that Sean could say, if you try to touch my cheeseburger, I'm gonna punch you in the face, right? That's, a, that's an example of an excludable good. It is a thing where you could actually like put your arms around something and say, this is mine and you can't have it. Fencing a backyard, right? Putting a lock on your door, right? House, it, houses are not public goods. It doesn't matter even if they are, <clears throat> even if, you know, so we talk about public housing as if it were a, like that's a public good. It's not a public good. Right. It may be paid for by the public, hence public housing, but it's not a public good in the sense that I've got a three bedroom, you know, townhouse in a public housing unit. I have three kids. They each have, you know, I have or I have two kids and myself and my wife, for example, that's, you know, one kid in each bedroom and then me and my wife in the third room. If you then decide to move into my house, there's there's less room. Right. It's a it's a more crowded situation it's not it is a rival good right so public housing is a rival good in the sense that if you add an additional user the quality the value of the asset for each each user goes down right so now there's you know now you move into my house well i gotta double up my kids into to one bedroom they're less happy right because they're on top of each other and then you bring in your you know two of your best friends and now you're like you're all like making a mess in the bathroom and you're not cleaning your dishes right and the whole thing kind of starts to be pretty miserable so this is an example of a rival house is a rival good whether it's paid for by the public or whether it's or whether you pay for it right it's a rival good it is also an excludable good because the moment you walk out the door i'm changing the locks you're not coming back right so it's a rival, it's rival in the sense that additional users reduce the overall value to the current users. And it's excludable, excludable in the sense that I can stop you from coming in. Now the government might say, well, you have to let, you know, you have to let anybody who wants to live in your house live there. Then it stops being an excludable good, but that's kind of a weird, like, you know, uh, exception. Normally I could just stand at my door and say, no, you cannot, you know, you shall not pass, right? Um, name that movie. What? Lord of the Rings. Good. Thank you. All right. I'm not the only nerd in the room. Um, so, right. So you have, so, so, so a house is an excludable good, even if it's paid for by, by the public, i.e., you know, so, so a public housing advocate might say, well, public housing is a public good. Eh, no, not really. Um, you can say it's a good that we want to pay for, but it's not a public good in the sense of what we're talking about here. Um, so you can have non-rival goods, right? You can have non-rival goods and you can have non-excludable goods. And they're often the same kind of thing. Um, so the best example of a non-rival, non-excludable good are things like um, 
are things like radio, right? Um, uh, television when it back when it was broadcast television, those are non-rival, non-excludable goods. Um, one of the problems the music industry had was when we started having MP3s, and you know, it used to be if I wanted to make a copy of, of of a song or you know, I would have to borrow your CD and then I would use my tape deck and I would copy it over, right? Um, and that was a bit of a hassle. It was doable. It was technically piracy even back then, right? But we had a whole thing about mixtapes and you know, you make one and give it to your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. Ooh, honey, I love you so much. This is how we can listen to this song. It's so meaningful. Oh, and this one's our song, right? And you make, so you make these things, right? Um, technically still theft, um, but once we hit MP3s, it became possible to share those like, you know, hey, yeah, you want, I've got the whole new album of, you know, uh, Boys to Men. And of course, Angela loves Boys to Men. So I just shoot her the, she's rolling her eyes. I would shoot her, you know, Boys to Men, right? Add it to her collection. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and then, you know, and then we had, uh, you probably don't, you don't remember it. You may have heard of it, Napster, where you could like upload your whole music library and then I could log on and take whatever I wanted. We had this kind of file sharing thing. So MP3 made it really super easy to share. <clears throat> so electronic media is basically, um, is non-rival, right? If I share a copy of my latest, you know, the latest Boys to Men album with Angela, she has a copy of it, I have a copy of it. The two of us have the same experience with um, the Boys to Men uh, album. Like we're both equally excited about that, right? You're totally excited about it. I'm totally excited about it. Um, and, so, uh, uh, and so that's non-rival good. It is excludable in the sense that, to some degree, in the sense that um, if I don't give it to her, she can't have it, right? Like I could stop her from getting it. The problem is that there's so many other ways to get it that like, you know, if you can just upload a MP3 to the web and somebody else can just download it, then you're starting to run into an area where is it really excludable anymore? And that's the problem that the, um, that the recording industry had ran into back in the early 2000s as the internet took off and we had companies like Napster that were making it possible to share um, what had previously been excludable content in the sense that the only way you could get it was if you bought a CD or you bought an, uh, an, an album and brought it home and you could share it, but it wouldn't, wasn't easy to share it on a mass scale. Um, so an MP3 is a non-rival good. Any sort of information is non-rival, um, right? So, so that's useful, but there are excludable things too, right? So some aspects of that are excludable, uh, such as, you know, even MP3s are excludable. I have to give it to you. You can't, it's not like it's just hanging out there unless I put it up on the web, in which case, case it becomes kind of both non-rival and non-excludable. Um, now, uh, non-rival and excludable, um, we could argue about it, but a lot of times these are called club goods um, in the sense that in some senses, more people actually makes it more valuable, right? So um, think of Twitter, for example, or whatever social media you happen to like using where you have a lot, I mean, I, I really, probably most of you are not really Twitter users. What social media do you guys use a lot of? Instagram maybe? Um, okay, so let's say Instagram. If there was just like three people on Instagram, would that be valuable? Would it be as exciting to be on Instagram, right? So this is an example we call a network good um, where the more people that are on Instagram, the more valuable it is because you can go out and see all the cool pictures that people are taking of whatever, you know, whether it's like, let me look at me, look at me, how cute I am, right? Selfies to, you know, pictures like I just showed you of, you know, soul going out and doing cool stuff uh, to, you know, I like to go on, I, I follow a couple of cooking Instagrams. So I, I get ideas for, uh, for cooking. Um, but, you know, whatever it is that, that floats your boat, maybe you're interested in surfing or skiing or whatever, and you're just going. And so the more people who are on Instagram and sharing pictures of things that you're interested in, um, 
the more valuable it is. Also, of course, you know, we all want to be, you know, admired. Uh, uh, and, and so we want to have people follow us too. That's part of the whole game of Instagram uh, or uh, social media is getting likes. Um, and so, so it's non-rival in the sense that one more person being on Instagram doesn't reduce the quality. In fact, it's the reverse of, of non-rival, right? Um, it is actually more valuable the more people that are on that. And we call that a network good, um, where the more people that join the network incre increase the value of the network. Right? Back in the day, <clears throat> um, cell phones used to be really expensive. You had to pay like by the text message. Can you guys imagine having to pay each time you send a text message? I mean, that's gotta be, you know, most of you guys, that's how you communicate. Um, but if you had to pay, say, 10 cents per text message, I'd bring up a pretty health, hefty bill for you, right? Um, but also back in the day, there weren't that many people that had cell phone. Like not everybody had a cell phone. It wasn't just an assumption. Well, of course, what's your, you know, what's your cell number? Wasn't a thing because it was expensive. Not everybody, not all, you know, not every 12 year old had a cell phone. Um, in fact, I don't think, when did I get a cell phone? I was 30. 35 <laughs> when I got my first cell phone, right? Um, you know, so back in the day, not everybody had a cell phone. So then you, you know, uh, so it wasn't really possible to text everybody. It be as more people had cell phones, it became more valuable to have a cell phone because if you didn't have a cell phone, people couldn't text you and then you were kind of left out. So that's an example of what we call a network good. It's the opposite of a rival of, or, uh, of, an, of being rival, it actually, increases in value with the more people that can use it. So, um, so not only is it non-rival, but it's actually increases in value, right? But, it, but Instagram is excludable in the sense that Instagram can kick you off, right? As President Trump learned from, from Twitter, like that you can, you can be booted off the, off the, the service if you uh, do things like, you know, suggest that people should, should storm the Capitol. Um, that's not a appropriate behavior, even if you are president. Um, so, uh, so you have, so you do have these things called that are non-rival, but excludable. So Instagram is a good example of that. Other club, and these are called club goods. Um, so clubs, right? More people. It's not having one more person join your club is not necessarily. Uh, isn't going to reduce the value to everybody else, but you can keep people out. So you keep people. So, so it, some of the value of a club is who's let in and who's not let in. Right. Um, so, you know, you have a snotty um, country club, you know, for those of you that, you know, maybe uh, either you're from a wealthy family, um, you know, and you're members of the club and, and it's expensive to join the club. And there's a reason why it's expensive to join the club it's because we don't want poor people in our club, right? We only want rich people in our club. So it isn't that it costs that much money to necessarily to run this club that we could have a pool and a tennis court and so forth. It's that we're gonna charge a ridiculous amount of money so that poor people can't get in, right? Um, uh, so, so that's a, and why do we do that? Well, because we wanna hang out with people who are like us that are rich and do important things and we don't want people, you know, poor people hanging around because they'll just bring, you know, ruin the party. Um, so it's non-rival in the sense that, sure, we we'll take one more rich person all day long. We're just not going to take any more poor people. And so it's non-rival, but not excludable. Um, excuse me. It's non-rival, but excludable. Um, and then we have, when we have, so, so when things are excludable, right, we can make people pay for them. We can make people contribute. Uh, whether it's rival or non-rival, we can make people pay. So to be a member of a club, we can make you pay. Um, but when something becomes non-excludable, we can't make people pay. So you can't make people pay for a radio signal. If you decide I'm going to set up pirate radio, you know, um, you know, this, this is uh, Alila coming to you live from the Gables, you know, um, uh, talking to you about, you know, all the latest cool stuff I learned in HMP 401 today, you know, um, uh, uh, once Alila puts that signal out, right, into the, you know, out into the world, there's no, there's no excluding, you know, she can't be like, well, I don't really want, you know, Jack to listen to it, 
Uh, so I'm going to, you know, everybody except Jack can listen to it, or I should say the Jacks. The Jacks can't listen to it, right? But everybody, all your rest, you can listen, but not, you can't stop, you can't do that. Once she launches it out there, there's no stopping the Jacks from listening to it, whether she wants them to or not, um, right? So, uh, so that is, so radio signal is an example, both of being non-excludable and non-rival in the sense that adding one more person, like if Jack one and Jack two, both listen to this, to, to Leela's broadcast, right? Um, then they, uh, there's no decrease in value to uh, Sean, right? And to Angela and so forth, right? Everybody else still can listen to all the cool stuff that Alila is talking about on her broadcast. <clears throat> now, um, so that's a, that is the example of public goods. Um, rival non-excludable are what we call common goods. And these are things that get run over because people are like, woo, it's free, right? And then they go trash place. So Hampton Beach, the example I used last time was like, Hampton Beach on a hot day in July is gonna get super crowded, right? Well, there's only, there's only so much room on the beach. Um, and so, uh, uh, so the more people that show up on the beach, the less room there is for the rest of us, it gets crowded and, and the quality of the experience goes down. That's an example of a rival good, right? The more people that show up, the less fun it, fun it is for, for the people who are already there. Um, I mean, try to, I mean, how many of you tried to find a parking spot on a Saturday afternoon on a nice hot day in Hampton, right? Yeah, good luck, right? <laughs> not gonna happen. And first of all, it's not gonna happen. And second of all, if you can, they're gonna charge you 50 bucks for it, right? Um, so, uh, uh, so that's an example of a rival non-excludable good. You can't keep people out of Hampton because it's a public park, right? So there's, a, there's that, it's public. It's a public good in the sense that it's paid for by your tax dollars, but it's not a public good in the sense that it's both non-rival and non-excludable. Um, <clears throat> and then we have, like I said, non-rival, non-excludable. So true public good is the last one, non-rival, non-excludable. And so the classic example of that, you know, radio signal, right, is an example. Um, uh, herd immunity is a, is a great example. So that's something that's very relevant to the, what we've just been through, right? Um, we all get a shot, right? You get a shot in part to protect yourself, right? So you get, you get a COVID shot to protect yourself, um, but in part to protect your, you know, your friends and, and, and colleagues and random strangers that you happen to you know, walk by in the store or on the street from you know, breathing all your nasty COVID germs on them. Um, now, if you get a shot, um, you are contributing, you are both protecting yourself, but you are also contributing to this idea of herd immunity, meaning the overall herd, that's us, right? We are a herd of, of, of animals running around. You know, we may not like to think of ourselves that way, but that's basically what we are, right? So the more people that get the shot, um, the lower the transmission rate is. You've heard about that R um, measure, right? The, 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 the speed with which the disease spreads. Um, and so the more of us that get the shot, the less likely uh, that, um, uh, people are people in the community in the herd are going to get uh, the disease, whether they're immunized or not. And so the problem here is that's a that is a true public good. Herd immunity is a true public good. You and I, and you know, um, even Angela, get to go out and get the shot. I cannot hurt today. Uh, you know, we go out and get the shot, and. Uh, She's going to be my favorite HMP junior in two years. Um, so uh, uh, we go out and get the shot, and um, and we are we are our probability of getting sick is reduced, but our, we also give to the community um, a higher level of herd immunity, and this applies to measles and you know um, and mumps and smallpox and all kinds of stuff that's nasty that's out there, right? So there's a reason why we require you to get uh, 
you know, a whole boatload of immunizations before you come to school is because you're gonna be living in close quarters, going to class in close quarters with a whole bunch of people. And we want to generate as close as, as possible to herd immunity, as high, high level of herd immunity as possible. So that if some sort of disease starts, you know, flu or something starts going through the community, um, the higher the level of vaccination, the less likely that the um, disease is going to spread. Now, the problem here is I, I don't want to get a shot. I don't like shots. I don't like needles. Maybe I think that, you know, the Russians are putting little TV cameras in the, in the COVID shots. I don't know what these people are thinking. Um, uh, right. Uh, but I don't want to get the shot, a shot. Um, uh, so, but I'll, I'm more than happy to have you do it because if you do it, you reduce my, even though I haven't gotten the shot, if enough of you get the shot, I don't need to get the shot because there's not going to be any transmission of disease to begin with because um, uh, you're going to, by you having gotten the shot, you'll, you'll um, keep me from getting sick. The technical term for that, and even though it sounds a little silly, the technical term for that is a free rider. I'm a free rider um, in the sense that I am getting a benefit from you having gotten, I'm getting the benefit of herd immunity without having gotten the shot, right? Whether that's flu, COVID, um, uh, mumps, measles, whatever, I'm getting that benefit without having had the shot myself. Um, so I am free riding on your investment in, um, in, in getting the shot. <clears throat> now, part of the reason we want to achieve high herd immunity is because there are people that can't get those shots, right? So there are some people who are immunocompromised or other concerns that prevent them from getting the shot. Um, so there's those we don't call, you know, we wouldn't call them free riders, but we would call people who could are otherwise perfectly healthy and could get uh, an immunization and choose not to um, are free riding. Um, and there's no way for us to really exclude people, right? Legally, there's no way for us to exclude people um, from the community, the larger community. Um, uh, uh, and granted, certain places like you know you could. UNH, if it, the, the um, some schools are requiring students to get the COVID vaccine. The government of New Hampshire said, you can't, you UNH cannot require uh, students to get the COVID vaccine. So we can't exclude students who did not get the COVID vaccine, even if they were otherwise healthy. Um, so it herd immunity at UNH from COVID is a public good. Um, and uh, some people, if they choose not to get the um, immunization are going to be free riding on that. Now, maybe you've got a good reason. If you don't have a good health reason for it, then you're, you're basically free riding. <clears throat> okay, so, so another example would be national defense, right? You can't, you can say, you know, um, I, I don't want to pay taxes for national defense. And, you know, or you refuse to pay taxes for national defense. It's not like I can tell the Russians, hey, the whole country is protected by national defense, except for this guy over here, right, who, who didn't pay his taxes. You can come get him if you want, but everybody else, it doesn't work that way, right? So national defense is this, you know. Um, public good in the sense that it protects everybody, whether you've contributed or not. All right. So public good, theory of public goods is a really important concept um, in political economy. Um, talked a little bit about public choice in the past. I want to reiterate that just very briefly. Um, so again, uh, um, public choice as opposed to public interest theories of regulation, public interest theories assume that all government actors are basically all good, uh, not self-interested, and have incredible levels of omniscience and omnipotence, um, meaning they can they know everything that they need to know in order to do a to be effective at regulation. They have no self-interest. 
and they're not going to pursue, you know, directing contracts to their to their son or son-in-law, right? Um, you know, they're not going to um, abuse their positions um, for their own personal gain. Public choice says, you know what? Human beings um, don't don't become angels. I don't know if you remember the quote from way back in like chapter five that I showed you talking about um, from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, James Madison saying, you know, if we had a government run by angels, there'd be no, you know, if men were angels, there'd be no need for government. Um, and if we had a government run by, run by angels, then we wouldn't need to put any sort of controls on the government. But the fact of the matter is, we're not angels, right? Um, and, the, and, and when we step from the private sector working in business into the public sector to work in government, we don't suddenly become an angel, right? So human beings, if, you're, if you believe that the people who run businesses are selfish um, and pursue their own ends, then why would you believe that when they take off their suit and tie and they go to work in the, in the government that they're they're suddenly not self-interested. And so public choice just says, look, we're just gonna assume that the human beings that run the government are the same kind of human beings that also run the businesses in the world. And so they're just as self-interested um, uh, and just as likely to pursue personal gain. Um, so yeah, here's the, if men were angels, no government would be, I forgot I had the quote there, no government would be necessary, right? Um, and, and the public choice, perspective on public interest is that it's naive, right? And that they engage in what's known as the nirvana fallacy, which is to say that people who believe in public interest and take a public interest perspective tend to say, well, we have this market failure, right? Um, not enough people are getting immunized, whatever. Um, and so what we need to do is have government step in and fix it. And the reality is, if you look at the things that government actually does when it runs free, um, aren't always in the best interest of, um, of the people that we govern, that they govern. Um, now, uh, the ar argument from a public choice perspective is that policies that emerge from the political po policy process reflect the interests of powerful groups. So you met, um, you met uh, um, Steve Onan from the New Hampshire Hospital Association, great guy. I think he, he genuinely um, cares an awful lot about, he care, he's dedicated his whole life to, to promoting healthcare, but he comes at it with a particular perspective. Right, which is um, you know the perspective of the hospital from the hospital perspective, and we'll talk about this in just a second. Right, but policies emerge through a competitive process with organizations like the hospital association bumping up against large employers who want to pay less for healthcare, and the hospital association saying, "No, you should pay. You know, we should get more reimbursement for our services," and that bumps up against maybe the nurses association that says nurses should get paid more, and the hospital's like, "Hey, no, we can't pay you more because it's really expensive to run healthcare already. And if I got to pay the nurses more, then I can't afford to provide as much healthcare." And the nurses are like, "Well, that's how it is," you know. And then the physicians are like, "No, no, we got to pay the physicians more, right?" And then the teachers union says, well, we don't want to pay as much for our health benefits. So, you know, all these different groups compete for all these different are competing for the attention of the legislators and for resources from the government. And so public choice says, we've got this, we've got this, these competitive interest groups who are bumping up against each other and each trying to pursue their own interests, whether those are genuinely like, we really believe that this is the for the good of the you know world, or or no, or whether they're really just raw power-seeking individuals, you know, set that aside. The fact of the matter is that powerful groups and individuals compete in the policy space to get the policies that favor their the things that they want. Um, the democratic process, to some degree, put holds that in check, right? So if some politician right, is giving too much favor to a particular special interest, we can vote them out. Um, uh, and so, so, and then um, 
but there's a lot of risk with democracy. Pure democracy allows, um, allows even a small majority to dominate a minority, right? And so if you have a, you know, the way that the ACA got passed as Steve talked about when he talked to you guys was basically on a 51, you know, 5150 vote, right? With, um, you know, went through the Senate and it went through because the Democrats had one more vote, pushed it through uh, versus, you know, and, and so they, regardless of what the Republicans wanted, they got the ACA. Um, that's not, regardless of how you feel about that, that's, that's an example of a very modest majority dominating the interests of a very large minority. But nobody got killed there, right? We have a long history, in, you know, both in the United States and, and elsewhere of majorities doing really awful things to minorities. And so a piece of competitive federalism that we talked about is meant to protect all those layers of checks and balances are meant to protect minorities. Um, however you want to define minorities, the, um, the electoral college, right? You guys know, know about the electoral, right? So we had Trump lost the popular election to, um, to Hillary Clinton, but won the electoral college. The electoral college, you know, so a lot of folks are like, we need to abolish the electoral college. You know, we had, you know, Bush beat, um, Bush, uh, W. Bush beat, uh, what was his name? Can't remember. Gore, thank you. Yeah. Bush beat Gore. Uh, 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 back in 2000, uh, in the same way, he lost the, po the popular vote, but he won the electoral college. The electoral college was designed, you know, so it's like, oh, all these little, you know, all these relatively unpopulated red states out in the middle in flyover country get more, you know, get an outsized vote um, uh, relative to the very populous, you know, uh, uh, coastal country, you know, coastal states, you know, California, New York, so forth. Um, and the electoral college, you know, so you could argue, well, it's not fair, we should have a popular vote to elect the president. But the fact of the matter is the electoral college was built to, to ensure that minorities and small states, particular agricultural states, didn't get run over roughshod by large urban states. So it, the fact that Bush and Trump both won the electoral college while losing the, narrowly losing the popular vote um, is not a flaw, right? It's a feature of the system that, you know, that large, large urban centers can't just dominate the rest of the country. Um, and remember, when we're talking about systems like like electoral college, like should we have an electoral college or not? You wanna use that Rawlsian um, veil of ignorance. Remember we talked about that way back, right? The, the veil of ignorance is, okay, I don't know where I'm gonna stand on a particular issue um, when I emerge out into the world. How do I wanna build, what policy, uh, uh, sorry, what sort of structure do I wanna build in the world? Um, and the And usually the, you know, if you take that perspective and you say, I don't know if I, if, if I don't know if I'm going to be a Democrat or a Republican, if I'm going to be living in Kansas or in New York City, do I want a, a structure like the, uh, uh, or a, a set of rules like the um, Electoral College to be in place that protect minorities um, or not? But you don't know that you're going to be a big city Democrat um, who, who really thinks that, you know, um, progressivism is the way to go, or you're going to be a small town, you know, uh, conservative Republican. Um, so you don't know which policy set you're really going to embrace. And so which rule set do you want? I think the, usually the answer is we want something that's going to protect minorities um, because you don't know if you're going to be a minority in that situation. Um, all right. So, but you, you're good arguments against electoral college. It's just the reason it's there um, 
is, uh, was to protect minorities. So speaking of protecting minorities, in particular from the government, um, that's, here's an example of when the government uh, acts very much against the interests of, of its population and against minorities. So Tuskegee, um, the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. This is from, uh, you know, the, the phrasing here is from 1932. That's the name of the study. Um, and it was run by the Public Health Service. So the Public Health Service is a branch of the US government. And the study took in um, 600 poor black men, 400 who had syphilis, 200 without. Syphilis is a, is a sexually transmitted disease um, that uh, is terminal. It takes a long, long time to kill you, uh, but it is terminal. Um, and it, uh, and it uh, causes event in late stages, it causes dementia. Um, so you lo literally lose your mind uh, as a result of it. Um, there were no effective treatments back when they first started. So they were just saying, you know, so, so the fact that they took in these 600 uh, black men and told them, hey, we're going to treat you. Some of them got whatever treatment they could give at the time and some did not. Um, so they were doing a controlled study and they weren't telling, by the way, they didn't tell the men that, oh, by the way, you're part of an experiment. They just did it. Right? They just did it to these 600 men. Um, and they followed them. And this study uh, ran until the 70s, right? So it ran for 40 years under the direction of the public health service, right? Under the federal government. Um, 1947, penicillin uh, was found to be effective in curing uh, the curing syphilis. None of the men were treated with penicillin, even after we knew that, even after the public health service knew that they could cure them with penicillin, they just kept following them, just kept following them. Right. Until 1972, someone found out, you know, some, a newspaper found out about, you know, uh, about what was going on and the press started, you know, kind of descended on, on, on Tuskegee and said, what are you guys doing down here, right, to these poor black men? Um, and finally, the public health service uh, was, was, had to stop the study and actually treat the men. More than 100 men died from the disease or complications related to the disease. Um, they have since received, uh, some of the victims have received uh, uh, payment, um, restitution for what was done to them. Um, but this is, a, this is a part of the reason why we see uh, uh, challenges in communicating in particular to the black community uh, to say things like, hey, you should take a, here's this brand new vaccine brand new COVID vaccine. One of the, one of the challenging, uh, one of the areas where we've had difficulty getting uptake for the vaccine is in the black community. I wonder why, right? When you have a history like this in your community, um, you really destroy long-term trust. So this is one of the more egregious examples of abuse of, uh, of, of, of power um, and policy. Um, but that, you know, Tuskegee's far away. Uh, so let's talk about the Walter E. Fernald Development Center, also known as the Experimental School for Teaching and Training of Idiotic Children, located much more closely in Waltham, Massachusetts. Right. Um, so this was located in Waltham, Mass, founded in 1848. Um, uh, Fernald and his, and his, his colleagues were um, progressives. So they believed that they could um, they believed in, in progress, right, in general. So this is the Elizabeth Warren kind of wing of the Democratic Party, very much believed that, they very much believed in the public interest perspective uh, on policy, uh, that very smart people should be able to fix um, the problems of the poor and um, less educated. And so they really, Big in the 1850s through the early 1920s was the concept of eugenics, which is that some races are superior to others. Uh, races and ethnic groups are superior to others. The Nazis learned a lot from American progressives. In fact, that's kind of what they built their whole 
Um, you know, the whole Holocaust was, was very much informed by American progressives. We didn't ever go that far, uh, but we went a good long way. And, you know, um, and so eugenics, big in eugenics was, hey, uh, people that we think are, you know, less valued in our community, we should, we should sterilize them so that they can't have any more children. Um, so involuntary sterilization was something that they were doing here at the Fernald School. Um, uh, so from uh, another example um, was 1946 to 1973, joint experiments between Harvard University and MIT uh, uh, treated young male children um, with tracer doses of radio radioactive isotopes. Nominally, their parents were informed of the experiment, but this is grossly inappropriate. Um, and oh, by the way, the federal government funded these experiments. Um, there was a there's there's a long history, you know, of abuse and abandonment in these in this facility. Um, real horror story. Uh, in 1967, there was there were, it was estimated that there were about 270,000 children in the United States um, uh, who were institutionalized. So we talked in a prior chapter about institutionalization and deinstitutionalization. There's a lot of proof that young uh, boys in particular of lower socioeconomic status um, who maybe were abandoned or orphaned were confined to places like the Fernald Development Center um, and diagnosed as having learning disabilities um, or intellectual disabilities when they in fact were perfectly normal kids who just had bad home lives um, and wound up essentially, these are, these were involuntary confinement, right? So many of them grew up in these, these institutions and had to fight to get released when they became adults. So um, these are examples of, of, you know, what the government can do when it is not um, properly checked. So let's talk a little bit about regulatory capture. This is something that I keep kind of coming back to when I talk about and I don't mean to point this specifically at Steve. I just, he's just the one lobbyist that I happen to introduce you to, right? But uh, this is a regulatory capture as an idea um, uh, coined by a Nobel Prize winner, George Stiegler, an economist. Um, and the idea is that regulators come under the sway of the industry that they're supposed to regulate. Um, and so if you are the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services and your purpose is to regulate hospitals in the, in, in the state of New Hampshire, or you're the, um, you are the director of, uh, 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 insurance, right? So uh, you're the insurance regulator for the state of New Hampshire. You need to kind of know something about insurance if you're the regulator for, the, in, for insurance in the state, right? You can't just take like a kindergarten teacher and say, here, we're gonna put you in charge of, you know, being the regulator for, for insurance in the state, all insurance, not just health, health, life, commercial, you know, liability insurance, property, all that stuff. Like you can't just like wake up one day and decide, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the regulator. You need to have some industry experience or you're just gonna be talking like nonsense. First of all, you're not gonna know what, what the people in the industry are gonna, when they come to you. When, so if you're, reg, you're, if you're put in, you know, you're a kindergarten teacher one day and then you get appointed by Governor Sununu to be the director of HHS and Steve Onan shows up at your door to start saying, well, hospitals need X, Y, and Z. Do they? I don't know. I mean, like I've never worked in a hospital. I don't know how they work. I don't know how they're financed. I don't know, you know, and Steve starts saying, well, yeah, that's what you need, right? And then, you know, before Steve can even leave the room, the, the, um, president of the medical society representing the physicians in the state shows up to start telling you what they need, right? And if you've never worked in a hospital, you don't know whether they're just talking, like they're just asking for stuff because they think they can, or because they genuinely need it, or is that's the best interest of, of the state. So the problem is that typically regulator, one of the problems we have with regulations is, with regulators is, the people who are put into regulatory roles come out of industry. 
So our banking regulators are, are typically come out of banking, right? Um, they come out of banking because, and, and they become a regulator. They get, they get appointed to be a regulator because they know something about banking. Um, now, the, there's a couple of problems with that. First of all is this idea, so there's, there's, a, there's a couple of problems here. First is the revolving door problem. So this is, um, the revolving door is the idea that I'm a big, big banker. I've been working for Goldman Sachs. I'm forgetting the name of the guy who was a, a treasurer. I think it was Paulson, um, was treasury secretary under uh, Obama. Is it Obama? Anyway, he came out of, I'm getting the names mixed up a little bit, but, but the story goes something like this, was the president of Goldman Sachs, the, lar you know, the largest investment bank in the world, um, gets appointed by the president to be um, secretary of treasury, leaves banking as a banker to go into the secretary of treasury, which is the federal regulator for banking, right? So now he's formerly the president and CEO of Goldman Sachs, the largest investment bank in the world. Now he's the regulator for Goldman Sachs. Do we see any conflict of interest here? Like even if he sold off all this stuff, all his buds are still back in, in Goldman Sachs, right? And who has, who has him on speed dial? The new president of Goldman Sachs, right? And if he calls, you don't think he's going to pick up the phone and say, hey, Bob, how's it going? You know, hey, you know, Frank, Hank, we need you to do X, Y, and Z. We're really concerned about that. Well, he may not see, be that blunt, but he'd be like, hey, from our perspective down here in the trenches, this is what's going on. And Hank is going to be like, I know, because I was down in the trenches. I remember that. I'm going to fix that for you. Right? So the problem here is, is, is um, so, so one is um, Hank, right? I don't remember if he actually did or not. He probably did something to this effect. Leaves Goldman Sachs, goes to work for Treasury as sec Secretary of Treasury. And then when his time is done, goes back to banking. Now, if you think that's your career path, right? Let's say, and, and let's, you get appointed to be your hospital CEO, right? And then um, you get asked by the governor to come be uh, uh, director of HHS for the state, you do that for a couple of years, you're pro if you're not like 70 years old, you're probably thinking, you know, what's next? Well, it's probably not to stay in government. It's probably to go back to healthcare again, right? So how hard are you going to be on the healthcare sector if you know that you're going to go back to the healthcare sector when you're done? Are you going to piss off everybody that you might work with or work for while you're in the regulatory role? No, no, you're not, right? Because if you expect to go back out again, right? And that doesn't, and I'm taking it like the highest, highest level, but people will regularly go, kind of mid-level people will go, done, done 15 years at Goldman Sachs, now I'm gonna go jump over to the Fed for a while, do some work for the Fed, and then I'm gonna jump back out again and go back to some other place. I'm not gonna burn bridges while I'm in my regula regulator role. I'm not gonna, you know, and so, so this is the kind of the, the, you know, this is the problem with this idea of the revolving doors. People come in and out of government and back into industry again. We need people with industry experience to work as regulators, but a lot of times they will go from industry to regulation and then back to industry again. Now, that's one pro poss problem and possibility is they're going to keep thinking, I don't really want to make, you know, um, I don't want to make the people in my, my community angry at me too much. I mean, I got to do my job, but I don't want to be too hard on them. So that's a revolving door. Internalized beliefs. If you grow up, this is going back to what I was saying. If you grow up, if you, if you come out of college and you go in into an industry, you go into healthcare, right? And you work in hospitals for 20 years, and then we bring you in to be a regulator. This is where the I've grown up in the healthcare industry. I understand everything about the industry. I identify with the industry, right? And so when a industry representative comes to me and says, hey, we need something, I'm probably gonna be like, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I see you, I'm right there with you, right? Uh, uh, I, I'm gonna work on that for you, right? Even though maybe that's, the, the problem here is not that I'm gonna be supportive, like, 
regulators shouldn't be jerks, right? They shouldn't, they should have an interest in making sure that the industry they're regulating does well. On the other hand, right, <clears throat> what's good for the industry is not necessarily what's good for the broader community. And when you're a regulator, your job is to regulate the industry in the interests of the overall community, not in the interests of the industry. So sometimes the industry wants something that's not good for the, for the broader community, right? The industry wants, so hospitals wanna be compensated at higher levels. Of course they do, right? Is that good for the broader community or not? Well, it depends on you know, what we wanna accomplish. If you want hospitals to not go out of business, you might need to compensate them more. Maybe they need to stop getting paid um, you know, at cost plus and switch to PPS. What do you think about that? And you all should be like, that's actually a very good idea, right? Because it reduces love, you know, length of stay and it improves quality of care and all that. There's actually a great, it was a great outcome. But I guarantee you, the hospital association was not excited about that, right? Because it wound up costing them a lot in terms of, um, in terms of jobs and, and organizations going out of business. So you have the revolving door, you have internalized beliefs, right? So you tend to, if you come out of the hospital industry or if you come out of banking, you see the world through the lens of, of, of a hospital administrator or of a banker. And so you see the problems with these, with these you know, banker colored glasses or hospital administrator colored glasses and not you know, the, the per necessarily the perspective of, a bro of the broader community. And then, so regulatory capture, the idea is that the regulator is captured by the industry. In other words, the regulator acts on the interests of the industry instead of, um, instead of uh, by the interests of the larger community. So that's what regulatory capture means is, I now have regulators in place who are doing the bidding of the industry rather than doing the bidding of the broader community that includes the industry, but also includes every other industry as well as consumers and citizens, right? And the last one, um, is simple corruption, right? Which we luckily in the United States is not, it exists, but is not anywhere near the scale that a lot of other countries are at. So the first two are really the problems that we see in the United States, the revolving door uh, and, and this idea of internalized beliefs. And the internalized beliefs, you know, if you ask Steve, you know, what's good for, you know, what po policy should you get? He will tell you with tears in his eyes that things will, you know, we need to do this for, for he will, you know, for the hospital community. We need, we need to do this for the good of the, of society to, you know, get hospitals more, more money. And he will genuinely believe that, but part, you have to remember, and I like him, you know, and I keep, I'm picking on him, like I pick on Angela here and her music tastes, right? But every other industry advocate will do the same thing because they've grown up in that, um, like he's a true believer, you know, um, but his perspective is colored by his experiences as are all of ours, right? We all have different sets of experiences and we're colored by that. All right. Talked about bootleggers and Baptists. I'd like you to um, remember that, the idea that there's, you know, Bruce Yandel has this idea that, um, uh, uh, that you've got um, two groups that come together whenever a policy gets, whenever a policy is debated. And he says, you've got the Baptists and you've got the bootleggers. You've got the Baptists who are true believers that really think that um, a policy is gonna do something good. So the example I talked about was, Baptists don't want people to you know, want a policy that says you can't drink alcohol on Sundays. So this is example. And the bootleggers are the opportunists who are gonna make more profit if the government pro prohibits alcohol sales on Sundays, right? So if I'm a bootlegger, I'm gonna support this idea that we shouldn't be able to buy, sell, that stores shouldn't be able to sell alcohol on Sundays because if stores aren't selling alcohol on Sundays, I'll be able to sell more alcohol on Sundays, so it's profitable to me. So the Baptists will go to the, will be the ones standing on the steps of the, um, uh, of town hall saying, you know, holding signs saying, you know, um, we need, you know, stop selling alcohol, save your soul, you know, don't go to the bar, go to church, blah, blah, blah. Right, and behind them are going to be the Baptists saying, "Here's a sign. I, yeah, just got another sign printed for you. Go on up there and go protest." Right, I hear you know, 
um, let me help you out there because the bootleggers are interested in having that law passed because it gets it makes them money. I had an argument with one of my colleagues, you know, about the ACA and how you know the ACA getting passed, and I said I don't know why we did the and I don't like the ACA in the I, it's not that I object to all of its components. I don't like the way it was done. Um, I think it could have been done better. Um, and so I made a comment to the effect, I don't know why we passed the ACA the way we did. Um, and she got very, frankly, angry. And she's like, well, because everybody got tired of people not being able to get insurance. And that's why we passed the ACA. And I'm like, you don't really believe that, do you? Um, you don't really believe because you know what, you know what happened after we passed the ACA? All the small insurance companies went out of business and all the big insurance companies started making a bunch of money. Who do you think was behind, who, who's the bootlegger, right? So you've got people like my colleague, who's a Baptist, true believer, really thinks, you know, the ACA got through this meat grinder system of policy making um, because it was good for people. Well, maybe there were some people that, like her that truly believe that. But the reason it got through is because the insurance companies and the hospital association and the medical association all figured this is, this is going to make us more money. Yeah, that's, 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 that's how... That's a public interest perspective, right? So we, uh, she and I have different perspectives. I wasn't actually in the room when the stuff was written, right? But I'm pretty sure, given what I know about how politics works, that there were a whole bunch of lobbyists from the various associations making arguments about how the structure is gonna be because the way it worked out was um, hospitals made more money, providers made more money, right? insurance companies made more money and we all wound up paying more for it. So, um, all right. All right, that's it for chapter 13. We're a little behind here. Thoughts or questions about what I've just been talking about? Are you as skeptical as I am about politicians? You don't have to be, you can think they're great. Um, and you know what, most politicians really are pretty decent people, I think. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is to, um, when someone tells you something is in your interest, ask who are they and where they're coming from, right? Um, do they have an interest in the outcome that's not that's specific rather than global in the sense of like, okay, if Steve Onan tells me that this policy should be passed, if it's about healthcare, one of the things I'm gonna ask is what does it do for hospitals, right? Because chances are that's his, like, that's his lens. And I think true, Steve is a true believer. Um, he genuinely believes what he's saying. Um, and, and, but there's some risk to understanding that people come at a problem from a particular perspective um, based on their own experiences and where they're coming from, right? So it could be that that's the best thing, or it could be that it, maybe it's not, and that it's the best thing for the hospital industry, right? Um, all right, so let's talk about the future of the health system for the remainder of the time today and next time. So, this was from I don't know, a year and a half ago or so. China, I don't know if you know this, but China has had a one child policy for many decades um, because, the, uh, because the communist rulers decided that there were too many, that their population was too large. And so they needed to reduce the population. So they basically said, couples can only have one child. This led to a lot of unfortunate consequences, one of which is the, uh, well, the Chinese society, um, most of Chinese society is very poor. It's agricultural still. It's not as poor as it was, but it's still very poor and agricultural. And certainly back when this was put into place, I don't know the exact year, probably the 60s, <clears throat> a poor agricultural society where when you get old, right, you're going to rely on your retirement is having your son um, run your farm, right? After you retire, right? Or when you get too old to run it yourself. Well, if you are only allowed to have one child, 
and you don't have a son, you got a problem, right? Um, and so China right now has a imbalance in sex in the sexes that is not something that would happen from just natural um, uh, uh, natural pro uh, processes, right? You get slight imbalances, um, uh, but the ratio of, of, of males to females in Chinese society tilts towards the males in, an, in a way that suggests that this policy had a direct effect on the number of women, uh, number of girls that survived childbirth. So uh, really unfortunate um, policy that, that took away a lot of choice from, um, from its, their people. It's one of the nasty things that communists like to do is take away people's choices. I make no apology for disliking communists. Um, feel free to write that in my evaluation. He spoke badly of communists. I will say amen. Um, uh, uh, so this is, this is the population. And so the result is this is the population in China. Um, this is what the population in China looks like. So you have, uh, and now they actually are finding, they're actually, so they're removing the, the um, they, I believe they have removed it or they've raised it to two or something stupid um, uh, where they've basically said, you know, oh, wow, we've got a problem. Why do we have a problem? Well, we don't have, not only as people get wealthier, they tend to have fewer children anyway. Um, and so this is the number of males and females um, in China, and you can kind of get a sense of, especially look at the, compare the blue lines on the left to the pink lines on the right, particularly in the lower end there, and you can see there's a imbalance between males and females. Um, but um, uh, what you can see here is this narrowing at the bottom, a bulge of people who are you know, in their uh, adult to late adulthood, and then elderly kind of narrowing out. Now you expect the elderly to narrow out because people die. It's a thing, it's a thing. <laughs> I know, right, Alila, right? Um, so, uh, so, so you expect the top to narrow, you know, as people age. What, will you, what normal has typically looked like is more of a true pyramid. A lot of the kids, you know, historically, if you went back two or 300 years, what you would see in a normal society was, it was basically a pyramid, lots of kids, and then you get narrower and narrower because lots of kids died in child, you know, in childhood, we had lots of child mortality, right? And so we had kind of a rapid narrowing to the top. But this is what China looks like today. Ironically, here's what the US looks like today, right? Much smaller numbers, the scale, bear in mind the scale is, you know, uh, there's four times as many people in China as there are in the United States. Um, but we don't have quite as bad of a narrowing, but it's, it's bad. Like this is not a pyramid, right? Geometry here, not a pyramid. Um, uh, uh, and the problem with this is most of our social spending, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, were built on a pyramid, on the idea of a pyramid with lots of young people not drawing benefits, outnumbering the number of old people drawing benefits. We've known this was coming for a long time. I mean, I, I've been reading about this since I was your age, um, you know. So we've not, and that was already it was already well established fact. Like we've known about this basically since we put Medicare and Medicaid into place. Like as part of the problem was, oh wow, Medicare is really expensive, and oh wow, we're going to have fewer people to pay for it, right? So the fact that we basically had, instead of having a pyramid, we basically have a barrel, right? And that fat middle is moving to the top where we're gonna have more and more elderly people. It's gonna be a problem. It is a problem already. The number of people, you know, number of people contributing to social security, Medicare and Medicaid are shrinking while the number of people drawing on all those resources is, is increasing. So that's part of the reason why we have such a bad deficit right now, but we're not the worst, right? The European Union is even worse, right? They basically, I don't know what they're doing, you know. They're not having a lot of babies, put it that way, right? Not having a lot of babies. European Union is seeing population shrink. Again, European Union 
has an even more generous social spending um, programs than we do, right? We've talked about that, like, you know, free healthcare, most of, you know, most of Europe. Um, well, the problem is that as these people in the, this bulge in the middle move into retirement and the narrow bottom down there, there's more people in retirement drawing on, on resources from the people who are working, you run into a real problem with funding those, those resources. Now, a healthier look is India. Still a bit of a problem at the bottom, but this is a more true pyramid, right? Um, India is still really poor. We'll see that in a second. Um, but their profile is a little better in terms of if they want to get into more social spending. Here's Nigeria. There's a more true pyramid, right? Smaller population, but more true pyramid, right? So this one would work pretty well where you're buying, where the bottom of the population and the bottom rungs of the, um, the bottom rungs of the pyramid are paying for the top rungs of the pyramid for social spending. That'll work, but barrel shaped or hourglass, or not hourglass, I guess, whatever that would be, right? That, that's a problem if you wanna do social spending. So just thinking in terms about the world, like where are we going? So this is, this is the point, like where are we going now, right? Um, well, the world is now currently 7.7 .7 million people. China's 1.4 million, India 1.3 million, right? Followed by the US at 335 million. But if you lump the three of us, the three largest companies, countries, and we're bigger by, you know, by a hundred million. I think Indonesia is the next largest. We looked at these numbers a while back and they're at like 250. So they're, they're you know, a third smaller than we are. Um, India and China are going to have, the future is going to be about India and China. But let's just say that. The United States, if we can keep our stuff together, uh, which we're not doing a terribly great job of right now, we're incredible level of deficit, which I'll show you in, a, in, 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 if not this time, next time. I'm deeply concerned about your future. And I'm deeply concerned about your future because my kids are your age. Uh, and I'm deeply concerned about my kids' future because we have really bad governance in the United States. And it's only starting to show by the fact that we're having enormous inflation right now, right? You guys are experiencing inflation that I actually haven't seen since I was like 12 or 13 years old, when the last time we made a bunch of dumb ideas in, in, at the federal level. Um, and those things take time to, to take roost and to, to fester, um, and then they turn into like giant pimples and then they, and then they start oozing, and that's where we're at right now. Um, but the future is gonna be China and India. So you need to, if, if, if I will tell you, I tell the same to my kids, you need to learn about China and India because they're gonna have a major impact on your future. There's more English speakers in India than there are in the rest of the world, by the way. Um, and I was just listening to a podcast uh, yesterday and this guy, uh, this guy was talking about that. He's a, he's a tech entrepreneur and, and investor. And he was saying, in the future, the Anglophone, meaning the English speaking world, the English speaking internet is gonna be dominated by Indians, right? So, so, so the commun the, the conversation that's gonna be happening in the internet is gonna be dominated by people from India, right? Um, and so more and more, and the, the um, India has relative to its population, relative to our population, highly educated workforce, right? That is willing to move for opportunity. The Indian government is a bit of a basket case. Um, their Modi, their current president is, is very Trumpy. He's, a, he's very much a populist. Um, so he's causing a lot of problems over there, but there's a huge, India has a culture of education um, and they, they produce more engineers uh, than lawyers, whereas we produce more lawyers than engineers, um, they're going to be really dominant in our space in the future. China, same thing, just not operating in the Anglophone sphere. Um, there's more billionaires in China than there are in the United States, right? If you're, you know, the, the old saying is, if you're a, if you're a one in a thousand in China, there's a million of you, right? So there's going to be an incredible, there's, there's an 
what China is doing well is unleashing, um, to a degree, unleashing um, scientific progress there. They're trying to, on the one hand, because they're communists, they're trying on the one hand to the communist, the CCP, um, is trying to retain control over the country, but at the same time, create economic growth at a rate that we have never seen in the, like, in the world ever, ever. Like, what's happening in China is absolutely stunning. Um, but the problem, but, but they're going to, and I think they're, they're going to run into a problem where in order to have continued economic growth and scientific progress, you have to have freedom. And because communists, the last thing communists like is freedom, you're gonna, they're gonna run into a, they're gonna start running into a problem of, of, on the one hand, we really want growth. On the other hand, we wanna keep control, social control. Um, so they're, I, my vision of the future is, I think China is still gonna be incredibly powerful just because of the sheer number of people and their values. Like India, their values are very much about um, science, math, progress, Right. Um, whereas we are eh, still really good, but first of all, there's, you know, because there's four times as many Chinese people, almost as many, four times as many Indian people, um, we're going to be in for a run for our money. And this impacts health as well. Right. Um, I've talked a lot about, about the impact of wealth and health. So here's, here is GDP per capita, the amount of money earned per at the at the society level per person in their society and so the blue line is china the orange line is india and you can see from 1980 they were earning something like what did my note here say china was 431 dollars per day excuse me per year per capita india was 388 dollars per capita roughly the same at about a dollar a day so imagine trying to live on a dollar a day in 1980. Where have they gotten to? Today, China is operating at about $28 a day and India about $5 a day. Imagine, that's, my, that's not even my lifetime. I was born in 1970. So this is like, you know, I can't even imagine if, if from the time I was 10 to, the, to, to where I am today, um, if my family was making 28 times as much money as, it, as they did when I was 10. Like imagine what your life would be like. Imagine what everything around you, how everything around you would be different and what your expectations would be about health, wellness, all that, right? India, five times as much. I'd take five times as much, <laughs> right? It stays trailing way behind China, and we could have a whole long discussion about why that might be and why I, I'm actually more sanguine about uh, India than China in the long run. Um, I think it's because Indians believe more in freedom than China does. Um, now let's compare that to, well, let's compare their numbers to some uh, closer to home. So the top line is the US per capita GDP, right? Great Britain, the yellow line, um, the blue line, Right, right below Great Britain is Canada. So you can see we're head and shoulders over most other, you know, and if I threw all the other Europeans in there, they'd all be below us. They'd all be around the UK. We make more money than any other country, right? or any other country. There's poor people in the United States. I'm not saying that's not the case. I'm just saying on average, you know, we make a boatload more money and compare us to China and India. Wow, they've got a long way to go before they're anywhere near us, but they're gonna have more and more demand for health services as it grows. Now look at Mexico. Mexico has been flatlined, whereas everybody else has been growing, Mexico has been flatlined. Again, bad policy, bad governance, right? Keeps you from growing. All right, last slide for today, then we'll re resume. This is why I'm worried for you. So if we go all the way back here to, where have I got that to 1970, so when I was born, Right, all the way back here. The ratio of, of the US debt to the amount of money that we made in any course, course of the year. So the amount that the federal government has borrowed versus all of the money made in the United States over the course of a year. 
when I was born, it was about 30%. So that means that the debt relative, the debt was this big relative to the overall amount of money earned in the United States. Through the 80s, it's kind of hovered, got, it started to get a little heavier, but it was still pretty good. Through the 90s, it actually can't stand under Clinton. It kind of came back down a little bit. And then we just kind of lost our, our minds um, back in 2008, 2009. Um, and we haven't recovered yet. Like we went on a drunken spree of spending. Um, you know, we're out at Scorps pouring double shots of, of tequila, you know, and funneling beers and all kinds. And we just really like, keep, we're keeping the party going. And this is what has happened is now we are where you are, what you are going to inherit, right? Is a GDP, a, a debt to GDP ratio of more than hundred percent, right? The federal government alone has borrowed more money now is sitting on a debt. They owe more money. The federal government, we, they, we, we, right? As a, as a society owe more money than we earn in a year. That's bad, right? This is good. This is bad, right? Why is it bad? Because when you need to borrow money, like if we decide we have to have a major war, you're already deeply in debt. And then that kind of, that kind of debt destroys societies. All right. And that's, by the way, not good for health, just in case you were wondering. All right, we'll finish off next time. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, they should be up. They are up, right?